Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia and today we're continuing with our Trivia Let's Talk lore series. Last episode, we left off as Kanze was at Cao Cao's camp and persuading Cao Cao that Huang Gai's surrender is real. At the end of their conversation, which Kanze did really well to read Cao Cao's mood, Kanze was asked to leave to go back to Wu to pass the message to Huang Gai that Cao Cao is eagerly awaiting his surrender. But Kanze, keen to his mission, decides to play his role a little bit more by telling Cao Cao that he doesn't want to go back and that it's better if Cao Cao sends someone else back in his place instead. He's just trying to build up more trust with Cao Cao. And Cao Cao, hearing this, uh, repeatedly pleads with Kan Zhe that it's best that he goes back before people notice since it is in the middle of the night right now and that if he sends someone else new, the plan could be foiled. So after refusing to go back uh, three, four times, Kan Zhe reluctantly agrees to go back to Wu, which is what he wanted to do all along. So Kan Zhe sails back to Wu, reports to Huang Gai, and on the very next day, he goes to Gan Ning's camp to talk to Gan Ning, as he now knows that Cai Zhong and Cai He works for Cao Cao. So he's going to play his trick a little bit farther. He approaches Gan Ning, whispers to him the information, and the two of them sets up a play where Gan Ning, who also received a small beating and being refrained during Huang Gai's beating, is obviously not happy, and Kan Zhe approaches him and passes on some messages that hints at a possible surrender, and Cai Zhu and Cai He becomes increasingly interested in this conversation. Gan Ning keeps on sighing and plays along with the story, and eventually gives in and says that he also feels super disrespected by Zhou Yu's approach to the situation and disrespect towards older generals, and that he is also willing to seek out a better path. After hearing this, Cai Zhong and Cai He exposes themselves and says that we are currently working for Cao Cao as spies, and that if he's willing, they are willing to pass on a message to say that Gan Ning is also willing to surrender towards Cao Cao. Gan Ning sells them the plan, and Cai Zhou and Cai He passes a messenger along. Now, once this messenger gets back to Cao Cao, Cao Cao gets a little bit suspicious because things are going way too well. So first you have the beating of Huang Gai, and then Kan Zhe coming over to say that he's willing to surrender. And immediately after Kan Zhe goes back, Gan Ning also wants to surrender. That's essentially two out of the five battalions of Wu surrendering over to Cao Cao before the war even start. Things are going a little too smooth. So Cao Cao wants a new set of eyes over there to make sure some things aren't wrong. So who does he summon now? The one person who has been to Wu and his cover technically is still not blown, but he's currently waiting over here in Cao Cao's camp is our dear old friend Jiang Gan. Now Jiang Gan hasn't done much since setting up Cai Mao's death, but by being Zhou Yu's childhood friend, Jiang Gan still has his uses, so Cao Cao summons Jiang Gan and tells Jiang Gan that he needs to go over there to Wu to find out a little bit more about what's going on over there, to see if everything is going as smoothly as it seems. So Jiang Gan takes the mission, sails down to Wu's camp, and reports of him approaching the Wu's camp get back to Zhou Yu, and Zhou Yu immediately wants to play the same trick again. So Zhou Yu tells Lu Su, bring me Pang Tong. Now, Pang Tong is a character that we got to talk about a little bit here. This is the first time he appears in the novel, but we have heard about him long ago. His nickname is the Fledgling Phoenix, and it's paired up with Zhuge Liang's Sleeping Dragon. They are basically a pair. Uh, not that they are brothers or super good friends. They are friends. They know of each other. They are both used to be from the Jin province that are a group of scholars, and people nickname them the Sleeping Dragon and Fledging Phoenix because they believe their wits and intelligence are on par with each other. But unfortunately for Pang Tong, he's not the prettiest person in the world. As you can see how uh, CA did his model for his new portrait, he doesn't look that pleasant. And that's how he's described in history. But anyways, Pang Tong, during the war in the Jin province, escaped farther south. A lot of scholars historically uh, in Chinese history during different periods frequently escape south to escape the wars in the north because most of the war in Chinese history deals with northern nomadic invasions. But anyways, 
Pang Tong has escaped to the south, and through his relationship with Lu Su, and through his name as being the fledgling phoenix, he has been recommended to the Wu's court. But so far, he hasn't been used, and Zhou Yu wants to use him for this situation right here. So as Pang Tong enters Zhou Yu's tent, Pang Tong and Zhou Yu has a small conversation. Zhou Yu quizzes Pang Tong on what he thinks about the state of the war and if he have any ideas to attack Cao Cao. Pang Tong pretty much gives all the intelligent answers. You have to use fire attack, and the best way to use fire attack is to link Cao Cao's ships. So to set up this plan, Zhou Yu and Pang Tong plans out a little play. And Zhou Yu sends Pang Tong away. Now Jiang Gan comes into Zhou Yu's tent, and the first thing Zhou Yu says to him is, "You clearly betrayed us. Last time you came here, you drank, you got me drunk, you stole my documents, sailed back to Cao Cao, and my spies got killed." And before Jiang Gan could respond, Zhou Yu now kind of in tears tells him, "Now we are childhood friends. I don't want to kill you." But we're still at war. I can't risk you passing on more information, so we're gonna have to imprison you in a nearby temple. You'll be given food. You'll be taken care of. You won't be in shackles. You're just gonna reside in this temple and stay away from my camp until the end of the war, and then we can catch up at that point. With that said, Zhou Yu's guards came in and grabbed Jiang Gan and sent him off to the temple. And at temple that night, Jiang Gan,、uh, seeing that. He is now basically in house arrest. Just started to take a walk around the temple, and then he notices there's another person residing in this seemingly abandoned temple, and he approaches that person who is reading by the candlelight, and sees that he's reading a war manual. So he introduces himself.、Uh, I'm a scholar, Jiang Gan, formerly from Wu, and who you are. And then the other person introduces himself as I'm Pang Tong. And I'm known as the Fledgling Phoenix. Now, of course, Yang Gan have heard about the Fledgling Phoenix since he has been residing in Wu and Jin region. So he's like, "Oh my God, you're the famous Fledgling Phoenix. Why are you here in this abandoned temple?" And Pang Tong tells him, "Well, I escaped from the war-torn lands of the Jin province, ran all the way to Wu, trying to find a job, but because Zhou Yu is narrow-minded and not accepting of other intellects." He locked me here in this temple, so now I'm just hanging out here. Hearing this, Jiang Gan is like, "Well, I know someone who could appreciate your talent if you were willing to come with me, and、uh, if you're willing to work for Cao Cao." Pang Tong answers, "Well, Zhou Yu clearly is unaccepting and narrow-minded. I'm very happy to leave Wu and head back north if I can be protected by someone as great as Cao Cao." So the two of them made a plan, snuck out. And、obviously, the guards are not going to be really keen on protecting them, since this is all part of Zhou Yu's plan. And they eventually made their way to the Yangtze River and found a little raft and sailed upstream to find Cao Cao. Back at Cao Cao's camp, Jiang Gan introduces the fledgling phoenix Pang Tong to Cao Cao, and you can expect Cao Cao is super happy. Cao Cao loves talent, love famous talent, and Pang Tong is on par with Zhuge Liang. In that they both got a very catchy nickname at this early stage of their life, so Cao Cao throws a feast for Pang Tong, and the two of them discuss strategies, wars, in a very general fashion. And during this feast, Pang Tong was able to show off his intelligence and convince Cao Cao that he is indeed a very rare talent. So Cao Cao walks him out towards their camp, and he shows off their camp, how they're encamped, how they're storing their supplies, how they're deploying. And Pang Tong is really impressed, and gives little tips as well as gives a lot of compliment to Cao Cao, which only gets Cao Cao more excited. And they walk back in to the feast, and they continue their conversation about the war as Cao Cao is giving out more and more details about the war. And Pang Tong suddenly asks Cao Cao, "How are the sick doing in the camp? Do you have enough doctors?" Cao Cao becomes a little surprised because they haven't talked about this much. And this has been the secret that Cao Cao has been keeping away from everybody, because as northern troops traveling this far down south, the climate, the food, everything is different for them. And then they have to train on top of ships, so seasickness, 
illness are widespread in Cao Cao's army at this point. But Cao Cao didn't share this with Pang Tong. So how did Pang Tong know? So Cao Cao asked Pang Tong, I'm surprised you could deduct this. But yes, we are having a bit of a trouble with seasickness and illness. But we do have good doctors and things are going okay. Pang Tong continues, perhaps you guys are training the Navy wrong. I have a plan that could cure you guys of sickness and set you guys to win the war. Cao Cao becomes very excited and wants to hear him out. As Pang Tong continues, all you have to do is line up your ship by size. Big ships can line up 30 in a row and small ship can line up 50 in a row. Forge metal chains and link your ships one by one and then set up wooden planks that crosses each ship. Once you create a mass big enough, the waves will no longer disturb the ships. And because you have planks going across from ship to ship, your army, even your cavalry, can run across the ship and march down with the ships downstream, much like they're on an open plain. Hearing this idea, Cao Cao becomes super excited. He's already completely engrossed in Pang Tong and believes that and believes everything that Pang Tong says as he orders his craftsmen and blacksmith to hurry up and construct giant metal chains to start setting the ships up in formation. Pang Tong says, I can also do more for you. Because Zhou Yu wants to fight so bad, he enraged a lot of Wu scholars to set up himself as the commander in chief and to propose that the best option is not to surrender and go to war. So I can use my name and my ability to debate to go back south and try to stir up and sway the intellects to favoring you. This will not only help your war effort, but also help you to settle the people of the south and the intellects and the big clans after you unite China. Now Cao Cao is obviously happy seeing this, sends a lot of gift to Pang Tong and set him up on a ship and escort him down south. So Pang Tong gets out, but just as he's about to board the ship, uh, out on the docks, someone approaches him, taps him on the back, and says, your plan might have saved millions in the south, but you're sending men over here to their death. To find out who knows of Pang Tong's plan and whether his plans will get accepted by Cao Cao, come back tomorrow as we continue our lore series.